Right. Hello. Can everybody hear me all right? I don't, don't necessarily need to use this. Um, so this was going to be a fairly technical, evidence-driven talk about, uh, you know, for, for startup founders interested in blockchain, about how to put together convincing business cases tied back into um, a, a, a lost art um, that was state-of-the-art in the 1960s, 1970s called operations research and how uh, some, of the, some of the original science in that area could be used to write very compelling business cases using something that we've, we've done successfully at places like Lloyd's of London and, and, and HSBC. However, I was inspired uh, this morning by uh, Rich's keynote, so I've pivoted this talk uh, to really an extension of his I'm going to talk. So anybody who does want to talk uh, sort of hardcore business case construction for their blockchain ideas, I'm here all night. So just corral me and happy to have that conversation. But uh, I'm going to change because Richard asked some, some very interesting questions. Um, and, and some of them I believe I can answer. Um, just a little bit about me and why I'm up here. Um, so I've been working. So I, I run a small consultancy called FinServe Experts. Uh, we design uh, solutions that solve new business problems with uh, emerging technologies. And over the past few years, uh, the vast majority of our, uh, our, our work has come from two of those technologies, blockchain and machine learning. Um, I was with IBM for many years. Uh, I uh, ran their blockchain practice for the ASEAN region. In that role, I sold and delivered IBM's very first <laughs> consulting engagement with blockchain which was a letter of credit prototype for HSBC and uh, Bank of America. Um, I delivered the trade settlement prototype based on blockchain for Lloyd's of London. Um, worked uh, at M-Pesa using machine learning to create a credit scoring model uh, to make uh, M-Pesa's microfinance available to small businesses who have no financial history and could not qualify for credit any other way. I'm an advisor to UK Parliament on blockchain adoption and currently working with uh, Deutsche Telekom and T-Systems for their... So you make an arrangement with a neighboring farmer who perhaps had oxen that, uh, you know, that, that gave birth this year and, and has some new cows. And you say, you lend me your oxen for a few weeks so I can plow my field. And at harvest time, I'm going to give you 10 bushels of grain from, from this land. So you make the deal, you plow, you plow your brother's fields, harvest time comes, you take your 10 bushels of grain, you go over and you give it to him. And he comes back and he says, wait a second, you told me 12. I said, no, I told you 10. So you guys have a different recollection. And in this case, let's suppose it's an honest mistake and nobody's trying to cheat, cheat, cheat one another. Um, next year, you won't do the deal because you have no trust. Okay, you no longer, and you're, you're, you've got a serious problem. Your brother's family is faced with the risk of starving. Maybe you have to become a bandit yourself. Um, so the world's business, first business requirement, and it's a requirement that we still struggle with, is having an independently verifiable record of a commitment between two parties. As hunter-gatherers, we didn't need this. None of us knew what, what next month was going to hold, let alone next year. But as farmers, we can start thinking into the future. Okay, fortunately, you know, just as uh, as, as Rich was philosophizing, that we will rise to you know to the occasion and solve the challenges facing us with destroying our planet. The innovators of that time were were equal to the task and came up with an innovation to solve this use case. This is the innovation they call. This is a clay ball. It's called a bola, and they first started existing about. 4,000 years before the development of writing, so about 8,000 BC, okay? And this bullet, these are the world's first contracts. They are the first verifiable record of a commitment between two parties. And this, I would assert, is exactly where the collaboration, because without the trust, you can't have that collaboration. So this, and the person who invented it, unfortunately, we don't know who it was, is responsible for that fundamental shift in society that Rich was talking about in this morning. And the world's first contract, okay, keep in mind, this is writing won't be invented for another 4,000 years, okay? So how do they represent the commitment? Well, they use tokens. So the world's very first contract was a token-based contract. And the way they, you know, they did it 
like we do now, they used the tech, you know, the, the, the materials they had at hand. And the one thing in ancient Samaria that everybody had plenty of was mud. Okay? So they took the clay and they baked it into a hollow ball. And inside the ball, they would put tokens representing the number of bushels of grain you owed. At harvest time, the two parties would crack the ball open and settle the debt. And that's how, that's how this technology worked. Okay, so this technology solved the immediate business problem of how to feed your brother's family. But it also created an opportunity for the next round of innovators. And this is where the mark marks toward all the good and all the bad things that have happened. Because all of a sudden, somebody in this room said, wait a second. Okay, if I can do this for just one pair of oxen to plow my brother's land, why can't I have enough to plow 20 plots of land? Okay, this is what allowed people to stop thinking about subsistence and start thinking about enterprise. All of a sudden, somebody says, I'm going to now get a bunch of these oxen from everybody in my village, and I'm now going to be able to create enough grain that I can trade it for other things. Okay, so the existence of this first contract created a mind space where innovators of that time could start thinking about enterprise rather than subsistence. Okay, it, things got more complex from there. So once you had this, the next challenge was scale. Okay, so great, I'm now lending everybody's oxen I know, and I'm coming in and I'm plowing dozens of these fields. And one day I walk into my storehouse and I see a rack of these things there. And I realize I have no clue how many, how many tokens are in there. I've lost count. Um, so the innovators were again up to the challenge. What they did is they, they started taking the tokens and making impressions and just pressing them into the outside before they baked it. So in the middle of, of the season, I could just go to the storehouse and I could count these impressions and know how many bushels of grain I was actually in for. Okay, so this, again, enabled further growth. And uh, the next innovation was it to introduce a level of complexity, okay? So what we started to see, and this is all in the historical record, you can actually go to the British Museum and see, see these things, um, is start working complexity. So now I could say, I'm going to make a, a circle that stands for a bushel of wheat and a cross that stands for a bushel of barley. So you started to see uh, increased levels of complexity around the kind of contract you could make around one of these things. And then somebody had the aha moment. And this is about 4,000 years after. So technology adoption much slower then. Okay. Uh, 4,000 years, so he says, you know what? All the information I need is on the outside. I no longer need the inside. These things are fragile. They're hard to carry around. Why don't I just flatten it and scratch it? And the result is something you probably recognize. Okay. This is how writing came to be. And for another full thousand years, writing had only one purpose, uh, which was accounting, which was recording ledgers and contracts. It took a full millennia until somebody said, hey, I can use this for law, for religion, for art, for literature, all the other things we use writing for. For a thousand years, okay, accountants have always known that accounting is the most important thing in the world. Um, and for a thousand years, you know, it, it took a thousand years to realize that, that you could use this fabulous innovation uh, for other things. But this is really where this change in thinking started. Now, what does this have to do with blockchain? I mean, it's great that I could extend Rich's story. So I'm going to trace it a little bit further, and you'll see how we get there. Um, these things are large. They're bulky. They're, they're breakable. They're not very portable. And also, by flattening it, you lose that independent, verifiable, between two parties aspect. You know, unless you, you know, try to bake two of these things and have a scribe make sure that exactly the same thing. It's hard. The next significant inve um, uh, invention uh, and innovation towards solving this oldest of business requirements is this thing. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody? This is called a tally stick. Okay, and a tally stick was again a simple way of recording a contract between two parties. What you did is you made scratches across a piece of wood representing your debt, how much you owed someone, and then you broke it in two, and each person walked away with it. And because the break was never even, only the two original tally sticks would fit together, and you could make sure that the debt 
was uh, verifiable, but each person could walk away knowing what the debt was. You didn't have the problem with the bulla where, where the tokens were on the inside. These were valid as a uh, record of debt for millennia. Uh, the first historical record we have is about 100 uh, BC. Uh, Pliny, the, Pliny the Elder wrote about them. And they were accepted as a legal form of debt in Napoleonic courts. So they had a pretty long run. Um, when you're a kid and you learn how to count things and you write one, two, three, four, and then a cross, what you're doing is making these tally marks. That was the system by which you, you inscribe. Every fifth tally mark was a cross amongst these. Fun fact, bit of trivia. Um, the larger half, the, the smaller half of these, when you broke them in half, was called um, the foil, and the larger half was called the stock. The stock always got, went to the creditor. The creditor had the larger piece, and the creditor then was said to have stock in, in, the, in the lender, and that's how the term stock came to be. If you had the stock, you had the larger piece of the tally. Tally sticks were great for, again, having uh, verifiable between two parties, uh, but they weren't complex, and they only really worked well between two parties. It's not very hard to split the, the wood into three pieces. Next big innovation was this, this thing. This is called a chirograph. So this is a contract that was written, <laughs> in this case, in triplicate, and then cut along wavy lines so that when the three parties got together, they could see that this was an unaltered uh, you know, version of the original contract. And if anybody tried to make a change to it, uh, you would know who tried to who tried to fudge the records because the other two would be the same. Um, and then in the 1300s, the, the next big innovation, something that was so big and so massive that there were no serious innovations for another 600 years. Um, and that's uh, double entry account accounting. So any anyone who's taken the history of accounting knows that double entry accounting was invented by a guy named Luca Pacioli in, in Genoa in the 1390s. Uh, turns out we were wrong. It was actually invented in almost identical form in Korea in the 1100s, um, but was lost when China invaded Korea and burnt all the records of the, uh, of the Chosun Empire. Um, but uh, so the, the, the surviving version comes from the, from the 1390s. And again, they have uh, an original copy of Luca Pacioli's treatises uh, in, in the British Library. So there's, a, there's evidence of this. What this allowed you to do was basically uh, have a way of reconciling, again, relationships between parties. Because your, your books had to balance, your assets and your liabilities had to add together, uh, it was very difficult to, uh, you know, to cook, or, or much more difficult than it was prior to this, uh, to cook the books. You couldn't just add a new, new line in the ledger. It would no longer balance. It was a very early form, if you will, of hashing. And as I said, pretty much... Um, you know, people got better at this, and accounting, uh, you know, accounting practices changed and evolved from the 1300s to, to the 1900s, certainly. Um, but in terms of development of sophistication of contracts, this was pretty much it for a while. We had the, you know, the invention of, a, uh, of financial markets, starting with Lloyd's in the in mid-1600s. Uh, we had uh, invention of joint stock companies, uh, also from England, uh, a, a bit earlier than that. But um, basically... We're again talking about you know, small uh, evolutionary rather than revolutionary changes. The next big change happened about 1955, which is so when somebody first implemented a computer to make an electronic ledger. This happened, this was a payroll application for General Electric in White Plains, New York in 1955. And like the um, writing the, or, or, or pushing the tokens into the bulla, this was an invention of scale. Okay. This allowed what we now know as, as, as a modern multinational corporation to come into being. Before, companies could have operations in multiple, uh, multiple uh, jurisdictions, but there was no real way apart from just manually combining the ledgers to say this is a global enterprise. This is what changed that. This is what made everything possible uh, in terms of the multinational corporation and the level of innovation. Um, and this innovation has changed the world hugely uh, in a positive way um, from, from its inception and even more so since the advent of the internet. Um, our last speaker spoke about um, you know, some, some problematic reversals in, in poverty in England. But if you look globally, from the advent of the internet uh, until last year, 
the number of people living in extreme poverty has fallen by 70%. There is no period in history in which poverty has fallen as much as between the internet and now. It's an unprecedented positive change brought about specifically because of technology, uh, which is not to say the problems that are, aren't important, uh, but the amount of good that this has done for the world dwarfs um, any of these problems. Yes, we need to go on fixing them. We need to be passionate about it, but don't you, you can't lose sight of what an overwhelmingly positive impact this has had on life around the world. Um, so the next big change happened 10 years ago, which was the invention of Bitcoin. So what blockchain does is it goes back to that very first contract and says, I am going to create a way that multiple parties can share the same version of a contract, of a ledger, of a set of transactions. This is, a, this is, this is more than just uh, an advancement in efficiency. Now, as an advancement in efficiency, it's huge, and it's critical to the story because that is what is causing people to invest in it. So when we did the business case for Lloyd's of London, we determined that their operating cost for delivering insurance would fall by over 80%. Okay, the numbers were so big we didn't believe them. We said that this can't be right, but we checked, we validated, we you know we talked to everybody, and the, and the numbers are real. So, the, and the reason it's so big is that many large companies, whether they are providing insurance or manufacturing goods, um, or actually delivering uh, delivering aid. So, as you talk about uh, you know, Mercy Corps or, or Oxfam or these large aid organizations, okay, all large organizations share something in common which is they spend more time, money, and people keeping their records in sync with all of their trading partners than they do in primary value creation. That is true across all major industries. Okay? What blockchain does is it eliminates that. Everybody agrees to share a single record of what's what. Okay? There is no reconciliation that needs to happen, which means these organizations can now focus much more exclusively on creating actual value. Okay? We are actively delivering microinsurance for uh, designing the microinsurance for um, natural disasters in Indonesia. This is a project we have going right now. I actually talked about it at, 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 at BlockerCon uh, a, a few months ago. Um, and blockchain is what makes it possible now to deliver insurance. It was never possible before because um, the cost of administering a policy for, you know, say a homeowner's policy if, with a coverage of $200 which is plenty for many homes in Indonesia, um, is not much different from issuing a $2 million uh, policy for, uh, for you know, the, the amount of money and people you have to invest is the same, even though the coverage is totally different, which means to price insurance for poor people in a way that doesn't make the, the company go out of business um, looks very regressive. And you have to end up having to charge poor people as a percentage of coverage a much higher premium. Well, nobody wants to do that. Okay, because it's not fair. Um, but you have to charge that higher value because you won't be able to go on providing the business. You'll go bankrupt. Um, you won't be able to employ people. So blockchain changes that math. It says basically you can now originate all of these policies and handle all these claims um, without any cost because everybody, the broker, the carrier, the reinsurer, all the people who participate in the value chain are now sharing a single version uh, of, of that record. When you come time to pay the claim, okay, in Indonesia currently, if you want to pay a claim, and I'm not making this up, the only way to pay a claim, you have a village that's been devastated by a tsunami, is to put somebody in a helicopter with a suitcase full of cash and fly them. Well, and again, if you're talking about small amounts, the cost of that helicopter trip is worth more than the cost of the claim. Okay, so you cannot do it and stay in business. Okay, which means even if you have, you know, even if you're operating at a zero uh, profit margin and you're a purely social enterprise, you will fail. You'll go bankrupt. Okay, now we can fund directly into a mobile wallet. No helicopter trip necessary. Okay, because if you are in that tsunami and you survive at all, okay, research the one thing is true your phone is in your hand. Okay, this is something that, you know, when you looked at pictures of people in the jungle at Calais, um, you know, one thing they all had was their mobile phones. Okay, so this is you know this is a human behavior. We talk about addiction and attraction. 
the attachment has a benefit, which gives us a way to get benefit directly into the hands of these people who need it the most. Um, so this is really full circle about this oldest of business requirements that led to this great wave of progress and also these, these immense problems that we've had to solve. Uh, and it really brings us back to this, you know, the core. And I believe that, you know, uh, that distributed ledgers, if not blockchain in particular, really ought to be added to your list because this is going to have, I think, as big an impact on poverty, on access to education, uh, as, uh, as the internet did itself. And I use my exact time. Uh, so I will keep the agenda going, and anybody has questions can, uh, can just find me. Unless you want to take five, I mean, I'd be running late if I took questions. What's your call? So I've got questions. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> so I'm curious about, um, so I mean, from my perspective, 2017, blockchain was, was the label, was the uh -huh. massive hype. Everyone smiles on their faces. 2019 is like the hangover. Um, so, uh, me, me, meanwhile, investment in blockchain has tripled since 2017. Okay, so. This is. So this is the hype curve. So the hype curve was a, was an idea that Gartner published in 2002 when they were trying to understand the dot com bust. You know, so they had this idea of what they call the peak of inflated expectations, the uh, trough of uh, disillusion. Thank you. Uh, the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. So they described this curve. Um, now, what's interesting is to understand when hype curves happen and when they don't. Okay, so hype curves have happened for the internet itself, obviously, which is what led to the dot com boom for mobile technology. Okay, so but they haven't happened for other um, you know, other innovations that were just as big. Like uh, you know, that have had an even bigger social impact, um, like uh, like streaming streaming services or, um, or or the mobile phone. You know, when when the, when the iPhone came, you know, came there, there wasn't a hype curve. It caught people by surprise. Okay, another big one that didn't have a hype curve had huge impact is um, reliable contraception, which totally changed you know the entire history of women's empowerment. Uh, up and you know, women could no longer no longer had to be seen as property uh, because they could could take control over their own. Uh, you know, over their own uh, you know, re uh, reproductive cycle. Uh, so some, yeah. <laughs> some big changes uh, have hype curves and some don't. Uh, the hype curve comes when people's understanding of a innovation's power to transform uh, runs faster than uh, their ability to deliver on it, okay? I, was, I worked in the Silicon Valley for the entire decade of the 1990s, uh, saw all sorts of amazing things and all sorts of really mind-bogglingly stupid excesses. Um, and all, you know, the positive and the negative were all, uh, were all motivated by this shared belief that we all had that this thing called the Internet is going to change everything. Okay? And as I said, from the advent of the Internet until now, extreme poverty is, around the world has fallen by 70%. So we were right. It did. We had no clue which business models were going to work. We threw money at all sorts of stupid ideas. It didn't prevent us from being smart. And that's really, to my mind, what, what we're seeing now with blockchain, is we saw that hype curve. Everybody was really excited because they fundamentally got, you know, once you sit down and you think about it, it says, wow, this, this really can change everything. That doesn't mean you have the business model and that you have the technical model ready. <laughs> so um, predictable. The other thing is predictable, uh, and again, it hasn't happened the first, is that the first adopters of blockchain uh, were criminal enterprises. This, this, this is predictable. It happened with the internet. It happened with mobile phones. It's because criminal enterprises have a first mover advantage. Okay? They don't care about governance. They don't care about making their customers happy by, by definition. Okay? So they can adopt technologies on the whole much faster than those of us who have to actually think about the positive impacts of what we're trying to do. Um, so of course they're going to be first. So it, it bothers me not at all uh, you know, that Bitcoin was used to, to fund drugs. This, this was a, a predictable outcome. Uh, we'll move past it. Um, so yes, uh, I, I look at that trough. I look at the actual spending, and, and, and it doesn't frighten me, uh, which is a good thing, because I've kind of bet my career on it. <laughs> Any other questions? about the kind of narrative of the 
Sumerian yep. farmers who yep. invented that first um, bullet. Yeah, yep. um, I noticed that you told it from kind of like a, quite a male perspective, but it was like your brother's, uh, your brother died, and so you had responsibilities for his family. Do, do we have evidence? But it was definitely kind of men who were noticing these business, first business requirements and doing the problem solving for them? Well, we don't know the, who the inventor of the bullet was, but we do know that the enterprise was focused around patriarchal head of families. So the business case was based on the business, the enterprise structures at the time. And that survived, um, again, in, 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 in uh, Western Europe through you know, Rome, Rome, where the, the pater familias, the head of family, actually had the legal power to put members of his family to death if he chose. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, that, that was, that was a, a, uh, a conscious choice based on the structure of enterprises at that time. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I didn't yep. know. I'm always curious. Yep, no. The, the so, no, the, the inventor could have been a woman. Uh, we don't know who the inventor was. Yeah. But the business structures were definitely male-dominated. Okay, thanks. Yep. Well, the poverty statistic came up with yep. 70% reduction in world poverty since the invention of the internet. We have some citation. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's, that's from the World Bank, um, and it, it's, it's from, um, I believe it's from 1990 to 2016. I can, uh, if you send me an email, I can get you the specific reference. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yep. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I'm tempted to, your, your 70% reduction of poverty, I, I kind of, don't get me wrong, I'm going to challenge you, but I do kind of, okay. I kind of with you, but I'm going to challenge you. Yeah. Uh, it's almost a bit like, it's almost a bit like, um, um, like we, we, all, we all decide to go to the Bloom Festival and, and Cam and Bloom there, and we all go to the Bloom, and then we decide to jump out um, because we, we decided that the, the advice is, you know, and, um, and we're 70% of the way down and, and we look at each other and go, this is going fine, right? <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's, it's, whilst you, they, I, I, like, we could create this, you, I'm sure that there is accuracy and merit to that figure, actually, in that same period of time, with the, 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 the problems and the complications and, 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 and things that are happening in the world, that much has got worse, much is getting more complicated. Actually, the, but, but, okay, sorry, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's not true. Um, I, I, I would encourage you all to read a book called Factfulness by Dr. Hans Rosling, who is one of the world's most awesome data scientists. Of course, he died a couple of years ago, but he was personal data scientist the like of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Um, and he has done an amazing amount of research talking about how wrong our perceptions are that things are getting worse. They're getting astoundingly better. Now, in that, he pointed out there are two, th there are two phenomena that are actually getting worse, okay? Terrorism and climate change. Those are genuinely getting worse. The rest is all perception uh, based on the fact that bad news sells. And if you look at like male suicide, I, yeah, I'll, 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 there, there are all sorts of there are all sorts of measures where you say, okay, poverty is getting more people more people at work, unemployment unemployment is down, but, but the people are in, in short term. I, I, it, I understand what this, I, I understand. I'm not negating the positive, okay. but I'm just saying that it's more new often, it's more complicated than. than, than the well, of, of of course it is, but if I you know if I hear that the number of people in England who are relying on food banks um, is going up. I'm motivated to action. The fact that I know that poverty is, you know, is declining around the world doesn't change the fact that I want to, you know, I don't like the fact that more people in England are starving. Uh, I want to fix that. Uh, so you know, I, I, I don't want to at all dilute the calls to action. Uh, but I also don't want to resort to scare tactics. One of the hardest problems I have with climate change is people were telling me, have been telling me this since 1973 and I haven't seen it. I actually think that's a problem because I do think the climate change is a problem. But the, you know, the scare tactics are getting old and people are getting numb to, numb to them. Okay? There's a reason half the country voted for Trump. They're tired of being preached at. They're tired of being told that they are the problem for wanting to do well in life. Okay? That's not mean I agree with them. And I certainly think that Trump is the worst president, in our, you know, certainly in my lifetime. Um, but you know, when half the country votes for him, you, you can't just say, well, half the country are you know, uneducated racist bigots. It's more complex than that. What is causing half the country to turn away? What is causing Brexit to pass here, for Christ's sake? Okay? You can't just call, you know, saw, you know, think you understand the problem by calling people names. Okay? Their, their, their disaffections, their disillusions, their disenfranchisements are real. Okay? Why did somebody vote for Brexit? Why did somebody vote for Trump? They're afraid some, you know, somebody who comes from a different culture is going to come and take their job and their livelihood. They're afraid, you know, they read about 
people throwing gays off roofs in Lebanon and, 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 uh, and honor killings in Pakistan and, and, and female genital, genital mutilation in Europe. And they think that if they let somebody in from that country, uh, they're going to import those practices. Okay. Now, the policies that they've coming up to solve these problems are horrific. Um, but the fears are, are reasonable. And unless we do a better job addressing those fears, okay, uh, more and more people are going to turn to these, you know, to, to these assholes who have, uh, who claim to have quick fixes. Sorry, sorry for the mini rant, but it's something I feel passionate about. <laughs> Thank you.